text today is Psalm 51, and I just want us to read this prayer together from verse 15. Would you read this out loud with me? O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Jesus, we pray this today, that you would open our lips, that we would declare your praise. We would lift our voices as one voice to declare who you are. Our 
Let's join with all of heaven, all the earth, and declare his praise. With all heaven sing, and all earth below. And you can have a seat. As I get started this morning, first of all, I just want to give a, a quick shout out. Uh, we've got four families in our church whose daughters are state champions. I don't know if you guys saw that yesterday. Give it up for the Strafford Lady Indians. I know some of you fair Grodians, it just pains you to have to clap on that to some degree, but it's okay. Uh, we, we love them. You know, it's really cool. I got to watch that online yesterday, watch the game. And uh, here's why this is, is pretty amazing. This team, which is, uh, they're really fun to watch. You know, first of all, they won their state championship yesterday by like 41 points. It was like 81 to 39, okay, for starters. Uh, number two, they set they're the first team in the history of the state of Missouri to go 33 and 0. So that's impressive. They've won 49 games in a row. I mean, they're like Connecticut, you know, of the Midwest. And so that's pretty amazing. And then uh, our own little Abby Oliver happened to uh, yesterday. Uh, she now is the state record holder for the most threes in a single season with like 151 three-pointers. So I think we should celebrate that. That's pretty awesome and uh, just really cool. So uh, that's something I think we can celebrate today. And then I want to give kudos to all of you this morning. Uh, for, it is just brutal, this whole spring forward thing. Isn't it painful? I mean, it is for me, for some of you. I did okay this morning. It wasn't as bad as I thought it might be. But the one thing I've noticed, because I don't know why, I don't know how, how this plays out, because you wouldn't think this would be true, but I'm like really hungry. My stomach's already growling. I can't explain that. Just kind of a phenomenon about spring forward. Uh, I start getting hungry sooner or something too. But anyway, glad you guys are here. You know, last week we began this new series, Dangerous Prayers. And the reason we did that is because we just acknowledge the fact that our prayers are often a little too safe. God bless me. God comfort me. God heal me. God guide me. God go before me. God be with me. Those are biblical prayers. They're good prayers, but they're just safe prayers. And we said, what would happen if we actually prayed the dangerous prayers? The prayers you, you don't want to pray but the prayers that the Bible would lead you to pray. Are you praying dangerous prayers? What would happen if God actually said yes to every prayer that you've prayed over the last 12 months? What would the impact be? 
Who would be impacted? If you feel like, you know, I don't know that the impact would be that great, you've probably prayed a lot of safe prayers over the last year. Because if we were to pray the dangerous prayers of the Bible, like the one we talked about last, last week, Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24, this was the prayer that I challenge you to pray every single day this week. I hope you did it. Let's just do it together. Let's read it together. Say it out loud. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. David prayed that prayer and we joined him in this prayer and we said this is a dangerous prayer to pray. And and we talked about why, why we should pray a dangerous prayer like that. Well, this week we come into another dangerous prayer, also a prayer prayed by David in Psalm chapter 51. This guy just prayed some dangerous prayers, David did. I want us to read it out loud together in Psalm 51, verse 17. And and in the NIV version of the Bible, here's what he says. Let's read it out loud together. He says, my sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. As As David gives this prayer to God in Psalm 51, my sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken heart. Have you ever prayed the prayer, God, break me? I know we've sung it before. There's that song that's entitled Hosanna, and it has that line in the song that says, break my heart. God, break my heart. Wait, what's it say? (laughs) It's early. Oh, yeah, break my heart for what breaks yours. Break my heart. That's part of the prayer. Break my heart for what breaks yours. I don't know if you really meant it, Whenever you sing the song, did you really mean for God to break your heart? Because I'm pretty sure that hashtag break my heart is not trending on Twitter. I mean, you could change that, but, but break me is, is, is borderline scary. In fact, many of you may not even pray this prayer. You may not even want to go there because it just seems the opposite. Like, Lord, God, bless me. Bless me just seems so much better than break me. But I think we're going to discover today that you don't have God's blessing unless you receive God's breaking. It seems to be the opposite, but the two are closely related. A friend showed me an article this week. It was entitled, uh, it was written by Jennifer Lee. And here's what she said. This is powerful. She said, the secret to a vibrant prayer life means we stop asking for the fix and we start asking for the break. We stop asking for the fix, and we start asking for the break. Jennifer writes that she says, God saved me the day that he changed my prayers. She says, I stopped asking him to fix things, and I started asking him to break things, namely my heart. God would need to break me out of the miserable heart prison I was trapped in. Yeah, I was saved, but I was stuck. And she goes on to say, the only life worth living is the one where everything else is counted as loss. We stop asking him to give us more of what our heart thinks it wants, some kind of quick fix to be enough in this world, and we start asking him to break our hearts, to conform our will to his. We ask him to strip our hearts of the stuff that's crowding out Jesus. And we ask him to fill our hearts with more of him, which is more satisfying than what our inner critics demand of us. He offers exceedingly more than we could ask or imagine. And she goes on to say this. She says, here's the good news. When he breaks, he mends. When he breaks, he mends. Maybe we need to stop asking God for the fix, and we need to start asking God for the break. God, would you break me? Would you break this heart? Would you break me of my hardness? Psalm 51, 17. Let's read it again together. Let's say it out loud. Here we go. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. When David writes this psalm, it followed his sin with Bathsheba when he committed adultery with her. And he's just admitting in his confession, if you were to read the entire chapter, that the blood of animal sacrifices were not enough. They they just weren't enough to deal with his sin. They wouldn't put away his sin. It wasn't until his heart was penitent and contrite. You know, the same is true now. We have the most perfect sacrifice in Jesus. We have a perfect Redeemer. Yet his sacrifice has it does nothing to save us. If we don't come to God with a broken spirit, 
and a broken and contrite heart. To be broken means to be crushed under the weight of godly guilt. To be broken means to feel the weight of your sin and your guilt. You can't be saved. You cannot be saved unless you acknowledge that you're broken. To be broken is to see God for who He really is and to see ourselves for who we really are and to understand that we're helpless to do anything about the gap that only God can mend. To see God for who He really is, to see ourselves for who we really are, to understand that we can do nothing to fix the gap only God can mend. And that's hard for us. It's hard for us because we are often in fix-it mode. We just want to get things fixed. We want to make it right. We rarely want to acknowledge we did anything wrong to begin with. I know husbands have been guilty of this for years, right, ladies, where you're, you share your heart with us, you tell us your feelings, and we immediately go into fix-it mode. And we start telling you how you could resolve that and how that could go away and how you can reconcile that and how that could be restored. And we start getting into fix-it mode. And it's not what you wanted to hear. You didn't need us to fix it. You just needed us to understand. You wanted our hearts. You wanted empathy. I used to think this was a guy thing. Used to think this was just something that guys got in trouble for all the time until I started reading your comments in Facebook. And I realized this isn't just a guy thing. This is a woman thing too. Because have you ever seen someone express their heart like on Facebook? And first of all, every once in a while you kind of think, oh, that's a little odd that they're putting that out there. But they'll share their heart and their feelings. They'll put it on Facebook and you get into the comments and even the ladies are coming in with all the fix-it mode stuff, you know, how to fix that and resolve that. And you can tell by the original person's comments, they just kind of wanted some empathy. They didn't need people to come in and start trying to fix everything for them. It's just, it's just kind of what we do. We go into that mode. And so because of that, a lot of times anymore, people, they don't want to share their brokenness, especially on social media. They want to present themselves as happy and whole and complete. And we can begin to hide the brokenness, and it would be a mistake. Jesus said in a sermon that he preached up on a mountainside in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, he said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And the way you translate poor in spirit in our culture is broke. Blessed are you when you just admit that you're broke in spirit. You have a desperate need for God. Blessed are you when you're so broke, you finally realize the reality of just how desperate you are for God. We need to be reminded of that. It's like the story I've told before of the, of the dad who was taking his daughter into, into the pool of, of water. It was about three and a half feet deep in the shallow end, five and a half feet deep in the, in the deep end. He could touch the entire length of the pool. But, but as he was in the shallow end, his daughter was reaching down, splashing in the water, his little girl. She was having fun, but as he began to make his way towards the deep end, the water, of course, began to rise, and it began to rise up her feet, up to her knees, and pretty soon it was up to her waist, and when the water started to rise, as he was going deeper, she began to squeeze tighter and tighter, and she began to climb higher and higher up on his shoulder, and he, he realizing this, began to have some fun with it, and started saying, you know, deeper, deeper, and she was getting, so pretty soon she's almost clear up on his shoulders, you know, by the time he got to the deep end, but if only she had realized at any point in the pool she was in over her head. Just because he was going deeper, had, she, had he dropped her in the shallow end, she would have drowned, and, and God uses, he uses these deep things in our life, our circumstances and our struggles and our problems and our affliction and our pain and our loss, just to open our eyes to the fact that we're already in over our head. We're not in control of the most important things in life anyway. And, and until we're thrust into the deep, oftentimes we just don't realize our complete dependence on Him. It, it's not that we're not broken. We just don't realize it and we don't admit it that we've always been held up by the grace of God. And so what I want to do today is share three reasons why you should pray this dangerous prayer, Lord, break me. Lord, break me. Three reasons. And here's the first one. Number one, it's because brokenness is required for us to see the extent to which we need God. It is required in order for us to see the extent to which we need God. You see, salvation comes when we're in a place of brokenness. When we cry out to Jesus, save me. It's recognizing that apart from God, we are nothing. And that prayer, break me. I, it's not an attempt to break ourselves. We're not asking God to destroy us. It's a prayer 
This simply says, God, help me to see the reality of how broken I am and acknowledge it before you and before others. Lord, help me to see it, to see me for who I really am. In the book entitled Break Me by William McDonald, he points out in the physical world that broken things lose their value. If stuff's broken, it loses its value. It's thrown away. But in the spiritual world, just the reverse is true. That which is broken and acknowledges it before God and others finds beauty and power in the healing and restoration of God. In fact, we see this when in, in the, the prophet Jeremiah. I'm going I'm to look at two different passages from Jeremiah today of a man who understood what it meant to be broken and was trying to convince God's people that they needed to be broken before God. It was Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 6, in which he goes to, he's directed to go to a potter's house and await further instructions. And so he goes to this potter's house, and when he gets there, he sees this potter who's toiling away at the wheel. And there's water, and there's clay, and there's mixing, and there's the whirling as the jar emerged. But something happened with that little piece of, of clay. It, it, it was marred, and, and it wasn't whole. And so the potter just broke it down again, and then he began to reform it into something beautiful. And Jeremiah is watching this potter as he works. And he pushed the clay back together and began molding it again as it seemed best to him. And as Jeremiah just waited for instructions from the Lord as he gets this visual, here's what God says to Jeremiah in Jeremiah 18.6. He says, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter does? Like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. God was saying to Jeremiah, and he was saying to his people, it's, it's a beautiful picture of God sitting at the wheel, and he's looking down on us, this flawed material, and instead of just throwing us away and discarding us, he refuses to throw it into the trash. Instead, he begins to reshape and to reform as seems best to him. He takes broken people with cracks, and he makes them new. This is not a junk heap. This is endless possibility with this one piece of clay. And so when we pray this prayer, God, break me, we're saying, God, take these broken pieces and remold them into whatever seems best to you. God, I know I'm broken. I know I'm flawed. I, I know I've, I've sinned against you. I know I have these weaknesses and, and I have these sinful tendencies. God, would you come and take this clay as broken and marred as it is. And God, would you build something beautiful out of my life? It is impossible apart from you. And God begins to reshape us and mold us. You know, it's interesting. Um, in Japan, there is a ceramic restoration process in the Japanese tradition that is called kintsukuroi. Kintsukuroi. It was developed in the 1500s. It's where they take broken pieces of ceramic and they seal them together. And instead of hiding the cracks and trying to disguise them, they magnify them by going into those cracks with gold. They trace over it with gold. Uh, here's some pictures of pottery that's gone through that, where they just take the broken piece and they Fuse it together, and they fill in those cracks with gold. There may be some other uh, pictures there they can scroll through. But this, this process takes that which otherwise would be discarded and creates something beautiful. In fact, there have been artists who have been known to take perfectly good pieces of ceramic and just break it so they can then take it through this process. This actually has greater value. It's worth more. It, it becomes more valuable, not less valuable. And that's what God is doing with our lives. He takes that which is broken and he makes it even more valuable, more special when we surrender daily to his working in our lives. He's not finished with you. So the question is, what does broken look like? I mean, when we're broken and we surrender it to God and we acknowledge it, what, what does broken pieces that are being reformed look like? Well, first of all, broken people that are being restored, they're repentant. They're repentant of their sin. They turn from their sin and they turn back to God. Number two, they make restitution. 
for wrongs that they've done. They make restitution with, with people that they've hurt. They have a forgiving spirit. People who acknowledge their brokenness are quick to forgive and show grace to others. They will endure wrong without retaliation. They will repay evil with good. That's what people who admit they're broken do. They repay repay evil with good. They honor others above themselves. They put to death public opinion and carry more about what people think than God thinks. They will confess to their neighbors. and I mean, they will confess their neighbor's sin and their nation's sin as if it's their own before God. They will keep their cool during crisis. That's what it means to be broken. I, I remember the hymn growing up that had these words, Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. And those of you who maybe grew up with this hymn, you know what's coming, right? And I am the what? The clay. I'm the clay. He's the potter. I'm the clay. Let's read this psalm together again, Psalm 51, 17. This is our prayer. Let's say it out loud together. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. Brokenness is required for us to see the extent to which we need God. But Jeremiah will reveal another truth. It's in his second book, the book of Lamentations. Here's the truth he reveals that brokenness is required to restore intimacy with God. Brokenness is required so that we can see the extent to which we need Him, but it's also required to restore intimacy with Him, closeness with Him. Jeremiah writes this book in our Bible called Lamentations. It's chapter 3. Jeremiah is God's prophet. It's about 586 B.C. And he writes Lamentations. It's full of metaphors to show the afflictions that Jeremiah as Judah's representative is going through and what he's going through is a is parallels what Judah is going through and here's what Jeremiah says in Lamentations 3 1 as he laments before God he says I am the man who has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath indeed he's turned his hand against me he's made my skin and my flesh grow old and has broken my bones in other words, this is how Jeremiah feels. This is what it feels like to be broken. It's, it's not pleasant. That breaking has taken a toll on him. He says, my bones feel like they're in agony. And the text goes on to talk about how Jeremiah feels like God has shut him into the darkness, how he's preyed on him like a predator. And he even says he feels like, like he's had a target on his back and God's just doing target practice with him, just shooting his arrows right at him. He, he feels the sting of every one of them. He was broken in body. He's broken in spirit. That's how Jeremiah feels. And then we get to verse 21. Yet, this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we're not consumed, for His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, for men are not cast off by the Lord forever. Though He brings grief, He will show compassion. So great is his unfailing love. For he does not willingly bring affliction or grief to the children of men. Why should any living man complain when punished for his sins? Let us examine our ways and test them and let us return to the Lord. What is Jeremiah saying? He's saying God doesn't want to willingly bring grief and affliction and pain and hardship in our lives. But he will because he wants us to return. It's not to pay us back. It is to, to bring us back. And just as Jeremiah was coming back to the Lord in his own life and knowing what it meant to be broken and then to be restored in his intimacy with God, he, he was paralleling the nation of Judah, which had turned from the Lord. And, and it wasn't until they were broken that their intimacy with God could be restored. This is all about relationship. You see, brokenness and intimacy go together. When you're broken before God, you can experience the intimacy of God, the relationship with God. You, this is true in your own life. You know this is true. 
If there was ever a time when someone just came to you and they just poured out their heart to you, and maybe they, in tears they just, they just shared with you their struggle or their hardship or the pain, and you were right there with them, it was in that moment that relationship and intimacy was built. Here very recently, I was talking to a guy, and, and in his circumstances, what he's going through with the sickness and near-death experience of, of a family member. We've talked, I don't know how many times through the years. Only connection is through our, our daughters who go to school together. But on this day, through tears, he just shared about what God's been doing in his life and what God's doing in his heart. And there's something about when someone is real and honest and they're willing to be broken and genuine before you, that real heart connection is made? Where you feel like, you know what? From this day forward, this relationship is not the same. We can talk about things. Maybe we never felt comfortable talking about before. Intimacy is found when there's brokenness. And when we let down our guard and we're willing to admit the brokenness, we're willing to, willing to confess, when we're willing to share our hearts, that is true both with God and with other people. Intimacy is birthed through that. So in Lamentations 3, 55 through 58, it goes on to say, I called on your name. Jeremiah says, I called on your name, O Lord, from the depths of the pit. You heard my plea. Do not close your ears to my cry for relief. You came near when I called you. And you said, do not fear. Oh, Lord, you took up my case. You redeemed my life. And here we have Jeremiah in this moment where there's breakthrough. He goes from brokenness to intimacy. He cries out to God, and God hears him. God draws near to him. Wherever there's brokenness before God, redemption and forgiveness is, is sure to follow. And that's why we pray, Lord, break me. Break me. Why? So I, I can have intimacy with you, so I can be restored to you. So that I can be healthy and whole. You see, we need that. Brokenness is required not only to see the extent of our need for God, and brokenness is required not only to restore intimacy with God, but brokenness is required for us to be forgiven and cleansed by God. If you want to have redemption, if you want to have forgiveness, if you want to be cleansed by God from your guilt and your sin, you must be broken before Him. There is no other way. Apart from a broken and crushed heart, a penitent heart, a repentant heart, you will never experience his forgiveness. That's why salvation requires humility, humbling ourselves before God, admitting our need for him. I think of that occasion when, when Jesus is at a Pharisee's house in Luke chapter 7. He's reclining at the table. They're about to have their meal. And the Bible says that a woman came in among them. And she began to weep. And she wet the, the feet of Jesus with her tears. You could have heard a pin drop in the room. She then began to wipe tears that were on his feet with her hair. And then she broke this alabaster jar that she likely carried around her neck because that's what most prostitutes did with their trade. One drop at a time, one man at a time, she broke it and poured it on his feet and anointed his feet. And Everyone sitting around the table is feeling really uncomfortable because she's letting down her hair. She's pouring out her tears, and they're thinking if Jesus knew who she was, he wouldn't let her even touch him. But here's what Jesus does. In Luke chapter 7, 44 through 50, the text says that Jesus turned toward the woman. So I want you to picture Jesus. He's looking right at her. He's looking right into her eyes. He's not even looking at the Pharisees 
the other leaders around the room. He's looking at this woman. And he says to Simon, while he's looking at the woman, he says, do you see this woman? I came into your house and you did not give me any water for my feet. He's not even looking at Simon. He's looking at the woman. You didn't give me water for my feet because it was customary in their culture. It was hospitable to wash the feet, especially when you're reclining at the table. He didn't bother washing the feet of Jesus, which might tell us something, but she did. He says, but she wet my feet with her tears and she wiped them with her hair. And Simon, you did not give me a kiss. But he's looking at the woman. But this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. It would have been hospitable and customary to give a kiss on the cheek. Simon didn't do it. He says, you did not put oil on my head. Would have been something that would have been a very hospitable and gracious thing to do in their culture. Simon didn't do it. And he says, but she's poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. Her sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. And Jesus goes on to say, but whoever has been forgiven little loves little. And then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven And the other guests began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sin? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. There were two that were desperate for forgiveness that day. Only one found it. And it was the one who was broken over her sin. Mourning over her corruption, taking her tears to Jesus, and Jesus forgives her. I'm convinced that, uh, Craig Rochelle says, I'm convinced that God made tear ducts in the eyes for a reason. He said, I mean, the nose runs anyway. I suppose God could have made just the tears come through the nose, but why the eyes? And he says, I'm convinced. I'm convinced that God designed the tears to come out of your eyes because you were designed by God to have someone looking you in the eye when you're hurting so you can feel their love. I like that. Maybe God in His infinite wisdom allowed us to cry because then someone else can can connect with us eye to eye when our heart is breaking. And Jesus looked her in the eye and He began to mend her brokenness. Kyle Adaman in his book, The End of Me, he asks a trick question. He says, which person in the story would you want to be most like? He says it's a trick question because if you had to choose, you would want to be more like the well-respected religious leader who seems to have his stuff together, the guy that everybody looks up to, the, the, the guy who has the beautiful home and has VIPs over for dinner. You know, you want to be that guy. You don't want to be the broken prostitute mourning over her sin who embarrasses herself but deeply experiences the love and the grace of Jesus. You don't want to be her. But he says the reason it's a trick question is because we want both. Especially those of us who have been Christians for a while. We want to be made whole without ever having to be broken. And the dangerous prayer that David prays in Psalm 51 is, God, break me. Give me a broken heart, a broken and contrite spirit. This is what I bring to you as my sacrifice. I'm not here, Wayne Bushnell, to break you. I'm not trying to convince you to break yourself. You're already broken. I'm just asking God to break you so that you can acknowledge the fact that you are desperate for him. Only when you allow God to break you are you in a place where you can acknowledge your brokenness. Only when God breaks you are you in a place where you can truly be free from yourself. Here's another way to think of it. Life's greatest breakings often lead to God's greatest blessings. God's greatest breakings often lead to God's greatest blessings. If God is doing the breaking, if God is doing the tearing, you can trust Him. I remember when we first were talking about this series. This is going back months and months ago. Corey and I were sitting there and we were just talking about dangerous prayers and especially this one called Break Me, because I'm like, who, who wants to pray that prayer? I remember Corey saying this. I wrote it down. He said, well, if God is doing the tearing, I'll trust him for the breaking, because he's the one who will put me together. 
I will welcome it because it's coming from him. That was good. That was good right there. When God does the breaking, he does the mending. And that's why there's no better person to go to with this prayer than to our gracious, faithful, compassionate God. Lord, break this heart. Lord, break this spirit. For you do the healing, you do the mending. He would never do anything that he would not do himself. In fact, I'm going to read you a scripture to remind you of something. As I'm reading this, I'd like for our servers to be dismissed for this time of communion. But this comes from Isaiah 61.1, where the text says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, Jesus says, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness the prisoners. This is the very thing that Jesus would repeat himself in the book of Luke when he stood in a synagogue. In other words, Jesus was saying that, that Christ, I will be crushed. I will be crushed. I will be broken so that you might be forgiven. And those of you who are broken, I will mend and I will heal and I will restore. You see, my blood was poured out for you. My body was broken for you. I'm not going to ask you to do anything I was not willing to do myself. And Jesus was willing to be broken so that he could bring healing and restoration and mending and forgiveness and reconciliation. And so today we can stand here as a people and admit before God we're broken, desperate for you, God. We are broken wanting intimacy with you, a relationship restored, God. We are broken, so would you forgive us? Would you cleanse us? Would you heal us? Let's come before God humbly and broken today. I'm going to ask you to stand. We're going to sing right now as we prepare our hearts for communion. And today, as, as the broken body of Jesus in the form of bread comes down your row, you can partake of that to remember a body broken for you. As the cup comes down the row, you can partake of that cup to remember, remember the blood that was shed for you. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, feel free to let these trays pass. It's okay. We respect the journey you're on. But I pray that every one of us right now would acknowledge our desperate need for him. Let's sing together. Almighty Father, by your sovereign will, you planned our redemption. For you so loved the world that you would crush your son. To bring restoration, there is none like you. Merciful Savior, suffered and crucified by the ones you came to save. By your Spirit, you were raised to life you have made a way there is none like you you were you are you will forever be you go before be You 
there is none like you there is none like you sing it straight to him there is none like you there is none like you you may be seated Jesus, we thank you that you were crushed for our iniquities. You were pierced. The punishment that brought us peace was upon you. You were broken, broken down to the raw materials of what you were made of, and that is love. And so we're praying today that you would break us. You would crush us. Break us down to the raw materials of what we're made of, and we pray that you would find faith. We know that you're going to find sin in there. We know that you're going to find rebellion in there. We lift that to you. We confess that to you. We turn from that. and We rely on your sacrifice to forgive us, to save us, to give us our new calling for how we can live obediently and faithfully for you. Turn us towards you, Lord. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. You know, at this time, our offering is going to be passed. And if you've not had an opportunity to give online yet, you can do that today as an act of worship uh, to our God. But we really also want this to be a time right now where you would make this your prayer. Just, God, break me. God, would you break me? And if today, for you, that is a prayer in which you are saying to Jesus, I need you to be Lord and Savior of, your, of my life. I need you to save me from my sins. I need you to restore me and heal me and make me new. We want to give you an opportunity to do that today. And if you just want to pray with someone today, we want to give you an opportunity to do that. Or if you want to place membership in this church, we're going to, we want to give you an opportunity to respond. So here in a moment, when Corey invites you to stand, I'm going to step out these side doors. I would love to talk and pray with you right there as you make those decisions to follow Jesus. We just want this to be an opportunity right now where we just turn our eyes on Him. That while He breaks us, 
Our eyes are fixed on him. We're not fixed on our sin. We're fixed on him to do the mending. So let's sing to him. Let's lift up our voices. And let's respond to what God would have us to do. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. that one more time. Let's stand together and sing this. Turn your eyes upon center of our lives. Be the place we fix our eyes. Be the center of our lives. He's the center of it all. You're the center of the universe. Everything was made in you. Jesus, breath of every
be the center of our life. Be the place we fix our eyes. Be the center of our life. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. Sing it out, church. And the thing. Would you please have a seat for just a moment? Good morning, Northside. As I share these next steps with you, your connection books will be coming down the row. We thank you for taking the time to fill those out each week. And if you are a first-time guest here with us today, let me say welcome. And we are so excited that you chose to celebrate and worship here with us today. And we would love to share some more information about our church, about our Northside family with you um, this morning. So please stop by our guest services desk on your way out to pick up that information. Gentlemen, um, a reminder, this Saturday is Elevate. So 7.30 this, um, on Saturday, there will be breakfast, and Paul Highfield will be joining the guys of Elevate to share. And so just a really great opportunity. If you have not been a part of that group before, it's just a really great time to connect, to, to grow deeper, to explore leadership um, topics and ideas, and um, just to encourage one another. And there's always bacon, so that's a good reason to come early, like 7.30 on a Saturday. But it's a great time. Um, last week, we um, sent off our Honduras team um, with some prayer, and they have arrived in country. We received word yesterday that they are all safely in country in Honduras. Um, but we just want to ask you guys to continue praying with them, um, praying for them this week as they're serving alongside the Riley family. And then we also want to let you know that we have a group of college students heading off this afternoon to Memphis. They'll be working alongside Service Over Self. So they'll be um, doing roof repair and some other things in some homes in the inner city. So it's a really great ministry partnership um, with Service Over Self. So please be in prayer for them as well as they travel today and work this week. Um, lastly, um, I just want to direct your attention to the screens for a short video about our parenting seminar. Honor is a concept that changes a person's life. I'm excited about honor because it has changed my life as a parent, but also as a person. Honor is a, a valuable concept in anyone's heart. As parents, we want our families to be warm, loving places to be, but so often our relationships are strained. Parents and children have a hard time. They clash trying to get things done. Children clash with each other. There's arguing, there's bickering, there's boasting. We have a hard time in family life getting along with one another. I would suggest that honor is treating people as special, doing more than what's expected, and having a good attitude. We're gonna take that definition of honor, show you how we get it from the scriptures, and then we're going to apply it to family life at every different stage. We wanna give you practical tools to help your children understand honor, what it means day to day, and have a vision for why they should be living it out. We learn honor at home, and that equips us for the rest of our lives. We wanna invite you to come to an event that's gonna transform your family. Register today. Would you stand, please? Um, I was asked, Tiffany asked me if I would just kind of give a personal plug for our parenting seminar. Uh, I'm going to be there that night. My wife can't. She's actually going with our daughter to the Junior High Believe Conference. So I'm just going to come, attend, and take good notes. And I want to encourage you to come. In fact, uh, uh, Scott Transky and Joanne Miller, who will be here that night, uh, they've written many books. But I will tell you the one book that they wrote that really ministered to our family brings up this very concept of honor. It's called No More Arguing and Whining and Complaining and You or Your Kids. That was a great uh, resource for our family, especially for me and Leah. And uh, I want to encourage you all, if you've got kids, come to the parenting seminar, sign up online. You will not want to miss that opportunity. And I don't want you to miss this opportunity even right here and right now as we go from this place, declaring the praise of our Lord. May this serve as kind of your MO for the rest of the week here, okay? This is the way we work as the people of God is that we declare the praises of our God together. Sing with all of heaven. 
Word. 